Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. Today I'm visiting my, uh, my friend Jerry Goldfeder, who's one of the country's leading election lawyers and a great politician who I love to discuss politics with. So welcome, Jerry. Good to see you. Yeah, you know- I'm sorry it's not in person. I know, it's kind of strange, isn't it? <laughs> I should say so. It's fun. It's fun though. Do you Are you old enough to remember uh, Edward R. Morrow? Of course. Have you ever in the history that you know of, of voting seen such a controversial, polarized um, scenario that has so many different options to it? Well, it's pretty stark. Uh, the the uh, coronavirus has been so disorienting and upsetting and frightening to the entire country. And it's, that's, it's an overlay on the polarization that's been occurring over the last many years, really, but has certainly been exacerbated by this president. And but, they, but this president and the Republicans um, have really taken, it, uh, taken a step much further than I thought would ever occur by them really opposing the mail-in voting in Wisconsin, forcing people to vote in person under these conditions where they're really putting their lives uh, in danger. And they were shameless. The Republicans were shameless. And uh, for the President of the United States to say mail-in voting is, is a terrible idea and it's, uh, it leads to fraud and so on, and really making people go to the polls in person is, is just beyond what I thought could ever occur. It's, it's really awful. And their charges of fraud aren't new. They've always had that position, but they haven't had That's true. What I can remember is the most notorious fraud case involved a Republican candidate, didn't it? It was that harvesting of votes that, what does they call that? The woman, remember the woman who went and collected all the votes? And well, we just had that congressional race in, I believe it was in North Carolina. Right, that's what I meant, yeah. Yeah, where, uh, where the the um, the board of elections or whatever they call it down there uh, really nullified the election because of the the fraud uh, relating to uh, uh, absentee ballots. Yeah, it was. It must have been so outrageous that uh, the Republicans went along with calling for a new election. But it's the Republicans, the Republican majorities in the state houses, a Republican governor. Uh, taking the, the cue from this president, who a lot of people are afraid is going to try to stop an election. And uh, well, he can't. Does he have the power to do that? Well, he doesn't. The president doesn't have the power to cancel the election or That's delay the election. That's never bothered him before, has it? I beg your pardon? He, he doesn't mind exercising power that he doesn't have. Or trying that, to. That's true, but this is a little more serious than uh, other examples. Um, the, the Constitution is pretty clear that uh, the states run the presidential elections, which in and of itself is quite bizarre and unique to our system. We have 50 states in Washington, D.C. We have 51 different ways of conducting elections, even for President of the United States. The president can't cancel it. Uh, the Constitution says Congress shall pick a day when uh, people vote for electors, the Electoral College, and Congress shall pick a day when the Electoral College shall meet and vote for President of the United States. The president has nothing to do with it. In fact, the president... The date, I'm sorry, the date is in the Constitution of no, when... the date is not in the Constitution. Okay. The date uh, for when people go to the polls and vote for the Electoral College electors pledged to Biden, electors pledged to yeah. uh, Trump. Oh, uh, Congress uh, did that in the 1840s, uh, the Tuesday after the first Monday in November. And Congress also has the authority, because the Constitution says so, to pick the day when the electors meet. So in the middle of December, the electors in all the states in the, around the country meet in their respective state capitals and vote for 
either Biden or Trump, the presidential candidate who um, wins their state. The Constitution doesn't pick that date. The Congress has done it, and the president has nothing to do with it. So the Congress actually has the authority to change the date. The Congress can postpone the election if it if the pandemic is raging in November. Congress can actually move it to December or January. Fortunately, it's a Democratic House and a Republican Senate, so it would have to be a bipartisan move to postpone the election. And we've never postponed the elections during wars, civil wars, world wars, depressions, all sorts of economic calamities. Uh, we've never postponed um, an election. If, but if the pandemic is uh, raging to such a degree that Congress thinks that it needs to be pushed up a little, uh, postponed a little, then it has the, only it has the authority to do so. And as I say, because it's a bipartisan, a divided Congress, uh, it would be a bipartisan decision. But there's a limit to what they can do because the Constitution says president has a four-year term and it ends. It ends on noon, January 20th. So even if the election were to be delayed, it can't be delayed too much because all the votes have to be tallied and uh, uh, by Congress, and the new president has to be ready to take office on January 20th at noon. There's no holdover in case it's not finished by then. It's not as if Trump can stay there uh, because his term expires on noon uh, of the 20th. So in worst case scenario, Congress postpones it. They still need to wrap it up. They still need to get the results by January 20th um, at, at noon for the new president. And by the way, if they don't wrap it up, if it's really close, and, the, and, no the one, <laughs> and no one knows who has won uh, the presidency, so we don't have a new president. Trump is out. We don't have a new president. We don't have a new vice president. Who becomes president? Speaker Pelosi, assuming she, the Democrats, <laughs> continue to uh, hold the House and she continues to be speaker. Wouldn't that so, be? <laughs> wouldn't that be ironic? Right. <laughs> So go on, finish. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, that's okay. So I think the chance is extremely remote that uh, Congress is going to uh, postpone the election. But as I say, only they can do that. The president has no authority. He can, he can say whatever he wants and he can uh, pretend that he has powers because as you say, he always does that. He thinks he has unlimited powers. He thinks he's a king, but he's not. And I don't think Congress would stand for him and the states uh, would stand for him getting in the way of holding an election. Right. Um, can the Congress uh, mandate, pass a law saying that every ele uh, you know, national election is by uh, mail? They can, they can. Even though, even though I said earlier that the states run their own elections as a clause in the constitution, uh, they run the election even for president. There's a clause in the Constitution that says that Congress can supersede that, can override that, and pass laws. We have that. The Voting Rights Law, HAVA, right. Help America Vote Act, various uh, congressional uh, laws that apply to every state. So Congress can vote for a uniform, standardized uh, procedure for mail-in ballots for federal elections. They can do it. Will they? I doubt it, but they might. Have there been any bills introduced, do you know? Yes, Senators Amy Klobuchar and, and uh, Ron Wyden uh, have introduced a comprehensive emergency bill to have uh, mail-in ballots uh, uh, throughout the United States for the upcoming federal elections. I predict it will pass the House, but I would be shocked if it passed the United States Senate. I'd be really shocked if he signed it. Right. And it, it, it most likely will never come up for a vote, right? In the Senate. That's probably right. Yeah. That's what the problem is. The McConnell. Yeah. The McConnell that's thing. why, as Amy Klobuchar says, we need to win big. 
to make sure that the House and the Republicans, uh, I'm sorry, the House and the Senate are in Democratic hands as well as the presidency. I know this is nonpartisan, but I just made a partisan remark. <laughs> That's all right. Um, you know, we've had this thing about uh, president in the states. I mean, when you said the Senate, every state has a different method or, or procedure, can have a different method or procedure. And then within a state, counties can also change things, can't they? That's right. In this, our state, we've been arguing about whether there should be a presidential primary on the New York state ballot. I mean, I don't know if it'll come or not come, but uh, why do you think that happened? I mean, well, and, and how did they do It's I mean, actually, I'm yeah, sorry, go ahead. You have ahead. to withdraw from the, the race. So, I mean, all the other candidates, because why aren't they on the ballot? Or would they be if the, if the court upheld? Well, think about it this way. Every presidential candidate has withdrawn, and I think they've all supported Biden. Right. So what's the point of having a primary? In including, it doesn't really make any sense. Right. So it would be including Bernie. Well, if there is a primary, the, they will all be on the ballot, even though they've suspended their elections, they've withdrawn, they've supported uh, Biden, whether it's the candidate I represented, Pete Buttigieg or Amy Klobuchar, Senator Sanders has supported Biden, Marion Williamson has supported Everybody. Uh, uh, Warren, they all have. So what's the point of having a primary? So that people can go out and vote for their candidate. Their candidate has, has dropped out and their candidate is no longer interested in doing anything other than supporting Joe Biden for president. Now you may think that that's a great thing, you may think that's not a great thing, but that's a fact, that's a reality. So it's not really clear to me what a actual primary would accomplish. And especially in New York, because we never had a primary to elect uh, the uh, delegates to the, uh, the convention to vote for the candidate, right? Well, we will have delegates uh, to the convention uh, whether we have a primary or we won't have a primary, uh, the, the state party, each state party controls uh, the delegate selection, uh, has a plan. And if we have a primary, there's a whole system in place. If we don't have a primary, the state party will work with the Democratic National Committee and figure out a method so that we can send delegates to the convention. But if we had a primary with everybody on it, and we're voting for the elect, I see. I mean, I, the primary that would have been in April had all that on it, right? Right, if we have a primary, right, then whichever presidential candidate gets 15% or more is entitled to some delegates. I can't imagine anybody other than Joe Biden getting 15%. Yeah. Maybe Senator Sanders thinks that uh, he can, but it seems to me under these conditions, especially with this, pandemic, where the presumptive nominee is supported by every other candidate, it seems to me that Joe Biden would be the only candidate who passes 15% by a great deal. Um, I, you know, Amy Klobuchar, Joe, uh, Pete Buttigieg, uh, 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 Elizabeth Warren, they're all going to tell people, I would imagine they're all going to tell people, vote for Joe Biden, don't vote for me, because <laughs> it'll decrease uh, Joe Biden's votes. Yeah. Um, and Senator Sanders has said, uh, we support uh, Joe Biden. So what is he going to do? He's going to tell people to vote for himself. Uh, it doesn't really make any sense to me. So the other talk, of course, is about canceling the convention, which is usually held in August. Is it August this year or July? It's, well, it was supposed to be in July and they moved July. it down to uh, August. Have, and, have you, uh, would you miss a convention? Well, I like to go to conventions for swag. <laughs> That's the reason I like to go. You like I meet to a lot of people, I have a lot of fun, but yeah. the nominee is, is usually chosen. When was the last time there was a convention where there was an active nomination fight? You were probably there. It was in 1956 between John Kennedy and Estes uh, Kefauver for vice president. I wasn't there for that. Come on. Or maybe you were at the Republican convention <laughs> in 1976 between Gerald Ford and Ronald Reagan. No. Other than that, that's not what conventions do. And, and if we have a convention now, Joe Biden is going to be the nominee. 
And I so, have, whenever I've been a, a delegate to a convention, I have not enjoyed it at all. Partially because, well, the last convention I was at was when Obama was nominated, 2008. And uh, like, I think like you, we were early supporters. Were you an early supporter of Obama? Sure. Yeah. So we're early supporters. The majority of the state is Clinton. We get to the convention, and who's sitting in the, with the delegation mostly are all the Clinton people who never supported Obama to begin with, you know? I was sitting in the balcony above our delegation. I hated it. It was a long trip to the convention. And now, of course, with all the, the inspections and the, you know, the going through the screenings to get into the convention, it was so awful. And I remember Jimmy, my husband, who was a uh, newspaper guy, um, he had to go in a separate line to get his credential. It, we hated it. I hated the whole thing. <laughs> And uh, so I'm well, not. That's because you're. That's because you're way too serious. I'm not too serious. <laughs> I loved watching conventions when they were all on. And the one convention I really enjoyed being at was the Republican convention when they uh, when they nominated George Bush. We were there because Jimmy was reporting on it, and it was a great fight about abortion, putting in the plank and everything. And it was so much fun to be an observer rather. Right. Than you know, participant. Anyway, the, the 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 fun is on the committees. I mean, I was on the the um, uh, whatever the, the platform committee. The platform committee for in in fifty in in uh, seventy two, and that was a takeover by the McGovern people. Basically, right. you remember, we came up with an incredible platform that was so to the left that everybody was just. <laughs> I mean, you know, how many, what did he get? How, did he carry any states? I don't Massachusetts remember. and yeah. Washington, D.C. Okay. There used to be a bumper sticker that said, don't blame me, I'm from Massachusetts, <laughs> when Nixon was going down. Right. There's actually, there's a, um, uh, there's a new program on uh, Netflix, uh, Mrs. America. Um, it's Not about Phyllis, it's Phyllis Schlafly. It's, it's on it, Hulu. Oh, it's on Hulu. Oh, yeah, you're quite right. You're quite right. Um, and uh, they depict a whole s series of scenes at the 1972 uh, McGovern Convention. It's fascinating. Uh, you get to see McGovern uh, trying to get the women's support, but not, not acceding to their demands, and Gary Hart, who was the campaign manager then, betraying, going back on his words, betraying the women's, and you see Bella and uh, Gloria Steinem and Betty Friedan. It's, it's, and Shirley Chisholm played yeah. a very critical role that year because right. she, she ran sure for president. It's, it's actually a very interesting, and I think it's, it's pretty historically accurate uh, of, of that convention. The Democrats or the women wanted to nominate Sissy Farenthal, right? What was that for vice president? I think she it was, was for vice president. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right, it's, yeah. Uh, it was, it's, you know, I'm trying to convince my grandchildren that politics used to be so much fun. <laughs> and so well, you have a granddaughter now who was working in the field in Iowa for months, right? Right. Did she enjoy it? Oh, she loved it. Yeah. yeah. And it's so that's great now because she was working right, the headquarters of the district she was working in was Black Hawk County. It was Waterloo where the Tyson factory is now, and all the attention is now on the virus and the closing of meatpacking factories. Right. Yeah. Well, you were supporting the same candidate, and you were living with a woman, your wife, who was supporting a different candidate. I'm still living with my wife. I know you are, but you're not supporting a different candidate anymore. No, so we're both for Biden. She was for a staunch supporter of Amy Klobuchar, who I really, really like and respect. And I, of course, as I mentioned, was for Pete Buttigieg. But yeah. I'm hoping that, um, if I may say so, you didn't ask me, but I'm hoping Amy Klobuchar is the vice presidential candidate. Yeah. I think she'd be terrific, and I think she's ready to be president of the United States. Is it really? I mean, people say, oh, she's too much in the center. But she's pragmatic, right? I mean, is oh, that I think so. And I think a, a lot of her views are quite progressive. Um, but she's, uh, and she's very smart. And she's very dogged and practical. And for God's sakes, you got to be practical in order to get something done. 
So what do you think is going to happen with all this election business? Well, I think that we probably won't have a convention. We probably will have some kind of virtual convention. It's hard to believe that people will be allowed to uh, mass together. You know, we're talking about thousands, tens of tens of thousands of people. Yeah, right. You couldn't, you couldn't have a place to contain it, right? Well, no, you can uh, in Milwaukee. Where? There's a is There's some kind big? of a center for it. You could have six feet apart from every day. Oh, no, no, no. You can't have that. Yeah, that's you what I meant. You can't have that. Yeah, that. yeah, you're right about that. Yeah. And it's, and we don't want to encourage, we really don't want to encourage people to fly if they don't have to. We don't want to encourage people to get together in these mass meetings if they don't have to. The people in other states who are protesting uh, because they want to open up get, you know get together with their they're just i don't even know i've lost my words because it's it, it's it's ridiculous it's crazy i i wonder don't they get it don't they understand what's happening that they that they're ignoring these uh health warnings and they're putting their lives and their family's lives and their friends lives in danger i don't i don't really get it i don't understand it now the voting come november because we're pretty certain that there will be an election. On oh, yes. Um, how many states do you think will have the, the uh, mail-in ballots? Well, we have a good number of states who already have mail-in voting, absentee voting. Many of them have restrictions. Like, for example, in New York, we have mail-in voting, but you uh, usually need an excuse. Right. Um, for it. You have to be out of the county or you have to be sick. I said you can make it up because nobody comes to see if you're honest when you say... Well, you we can. hope people don't make it up. <laughs> but no, the, the, but the, the governor, Governor Cuomo, uh, issued an executive order where everybody now can vote in the upcoming primary, June 23rd primary, uh, by absentee ballot. And the way he has gotten around our constitutional prohibition that only certain people can vote by mail. The way he's gotten around that is by saying the fear of the virus or the self-protection uh, because of the virus, you can check off temporary illness. So essentially everybody can vote by absentee and they've taken the, the governor has taken the additional step of sending, directing the boards the boards of election throughout the state to send applications to everybody who's registered to vote, which I think is a is a, a great uh, uh, procedure. Yeah. Um, it would be better if they sent everybody an absentee ballot, but at least they've sent everybody an application, so everybody can apply, and it's this uh, the postage is paid for, and then they have to vote. Then they have to get the ballot. Right. and fill it out correctly and, and send it in. In time. In time, uh, on time. You know, the primary and the election are extremely important, not only for president, but for the election for the state houses of government in every state, because then is the chance to change the composition of the legislatures that are now Republican. I mean, it's very important election to vote down ballot, as they say. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. In 2020, we will be electing a new Congress, of course. So on June 23rd here in New York, we will be voting in the primaries for members of Congress and the state Senate and the assembly. But all across the country, we will be electing state legislatures. And it's the state legislatures, for the most part, in 2020, that will, who take office in 2021, that they will be drawing the lines for the new lines for Congress and the state legislation, state legislative seats in their state. So the people we elect in the state legislatures in 2020, those people can really gerrymander all the state legislation, state legislatures and Congress, or they can do it in a fair way. So it's really important who gets elected in these down ballot races for state legislature. How do we convince everybody the importance of this? How do we, do you think that Trump has done that himself? 
Well, I think actually he's been an unwitting uh, aide here because I think that overwhelming numbers of people in this country, Democrats, independents, and so-called moderate Republicans understand full well the danger that he continues to have in this country. It's not just that his policies are detrimental to so many people, but he's, he's so unprepared uh, to be president of the United States. And it's really come out uh, so boldly during this uh, health crisis. He waited too long, but he also, he has no idea what he's talking about. And he, he really um, tries to sideline the health experts. It's terrible. And I think people get that. Okay. This is a good way to end the program because it's the urgency of your message. And yes. uh, so thank you very much. And I'm sure thank we're going to talk again because we're going to have more problems with voting and more problems with politics and everything. So thank you, Jerry. Good to see you. Stay healthy. Thank you. And you too. And everybody watching the program should also. Yes. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.